What is happening, team? You already know who it is. It's your host, Coach Hawk, and I really quickly wanted to thank you for tuning in. I genuinely appreciate it, whether you're a first-time listener or someone who's tuned in to every episode here at Anabolic Radio. We're driven by understanding and facilitating an environment for intellectual discussions around topics pertaining to nutrition, training, sports science, and physique development. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Bill Campbell from the University of South Florida. We spoke about a variety of topics ranging from nutrition, topics like refeeds, diet breaks, body recomp, all the way to topics around training, like individualizing volume requirements, the nuances of calculating volume, and exercise selection. I really had a blast speaking to Dr. Campbell. He was super kind throughout the entire episode, and I have nothing but great things to say about him as a professional educator and someone who just wants to make the world a better place. Before I let you guys go, I really quickly want to give a shout out to my sports supplement sponsors, Legion Athletics. No, they're not plugging me to say this. I just really believe in them as a company and what they stand for. If you have never had a chance to snag some Legion, I recommend you do so. You could save 20% off your purchase using discount code HAWKFIT. And finally, if you found this episode valuable, don't forget to take a screenshot and tag us on social media. And as always, if you need more comprehensive help with regards to your physique-related goals, you could always reach out for coaching. Without further ado, enjoy, team. What is happening, team? Coach Ishak with HawkFit Coaching and Legion Athletics and your host for today's episode of Anabolic Radio. I'm joined by Dr. Bill Campbell from University of uh, South Florida. How are you doing today, Dr. Campbell? Doing great. Looking forward to having a conversation with you. Yeah, yeah. pleasure having you. Uh, pleasure you have it. Pleasure having you on the podcast. And um, as someone who's a coach, I just want to first uh, start this by thanking you for you know some of the great work you guys are doing out in Florida because you know it helps people like me who are quote unquote, evidence based and try to, um, you know, coach their clients properly with, you know, certain guidelines for how we could do so. So thanks for that. And for today's episode, guys, if you're unfamiliar with Dr. Campbell, um, I recommend you go check out his research gate. I recommend you go give him a follow on Instagram. He puts out these um, daily or weekly quizzes. And um, if you're a coach or someone who just wants to learn more about sports science, exercise science, physique development, he's definitely a great resource to uh, to check out. So without further ado, Dr. Campbell, I know that uh, you guys have obviously had some, you know, quite awesome research come out of uh, out of your university, out of your lab the past couple of years. And one of the first things I wanted to talk about was that diet break study. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with diet breaks or refeeds, they're basically a form of intermittent energy restriction. And you may have heard this strategy uh, be referred to as carb cycling, which is basically days where you have, you know, uh, moderate carbohydrates alternated with higher carbohydrates. There's a lot of different ways where you could, there's a lot of different um, uh, ways you could structure a refeeding or diet break protocol. Main thing that distinguishes a refeed between a diet break is a refeed is over the course of 24 to 72 hours of feeding window, whereas a diet break is typically longer, anywhere from 7 to 14 days. Um, and then, Dr. Campbell, would you like to add anything on to what I just said, just to make sure we're on the same page? No, I, that's how I define it. Yeah, we call the shorter ones diet refeeds, and which is measured in days. And then when it's taking a break from a diet for at least a week or longer, a, we call that a diet break. So I think we're on the same definitions. Cool. Awesome. So... The main thing that, um, you know, distinguishes a refeed and a diet break versus something that you see people do like a cheat meal is a refeed is a calculated day where your calories are elevated to your maintenance calories, predominantly through carbohydrates. Now, Dr. Campbell, based on the literature and based on what we know about, you know, physiology, we know that there's uh, ample amount of evidence, reason, rationale to 
have an increase of calories coming through carbohydrates, but, you know, is there um, something that can come out of, you know, just over an overall calorie increase, or does it matter if we're refeeding predominantly through fats or predominantly through carbohydrates? Yeah, so the, the rationale as to where carbohydrates come from or why that's where the focus has been, at least in our research, there is a study that was done in females where they had a back-to-back high-carbohydrate feeding. And what that did, it, re- it elevated leptin levels, plasma leptin levels, when they did this, two days of overfeeding on carbohydrates alone. So that's that was the reason... Partly, I guess, that was part of the reason that's why what we chose to do. And the other thing is a lot of my research is actually guided by people like you. You're doing things in the real world. And then I like to come around, you know, after you've been doing something for a while, then just try to validate it. Like, is this effective or is it not effective? So that's why um, that was the, the rationale for why we chose to increase calories for two consecutive days, all in the form of carbohydrates, more of a a leptin response. So through that leptin response, obviously, that's going to improve things like, you know, our our, our RMR, thermodynamics to a degree. um, And it's going to help us when it comes to preserving that RMR, which in one of the studies that you guys recently conducted at University of South Florida. Um, that was one of the conclusions between two groups. So, um, you know, uh, I'll give the floor to you. Would you like to expand on the recent study that you guys did at USF, uh, the, the types of groups, and then the outcome? Yes. Now, I will say that we, we published this diet refeed study, I think it was last March. And now we've actually done a follow-up study that was a diet break study in resistance trained females. So that's, that's our actually our latest study. It's just, it's, it's in review right now. So that one's not published yet, but that one mimics the, um, to some extent that Matador study where we had them um, take a one, actually we took a one week break, two weeks on dieting, one week but I'm, we're, you're asking about the one that we published last year, which was the refeed study. So let, let me talk a little bit about the design. So two groups of resistance trained subjects, males and females, both of them went on a seven week diet and both groups had an average caloric deficit of 25% over the course of a week. One of those groups, we'll call them the continuous group. We said, you're going to reduce your calories by 25%. Every day for seven straight weeks, you're never going to change what you're doing. The other group, which was the refeed group, we said, you're also going to diet for seven weeks, but you're going to diet a little harder Monday through Friday. And on the weekends for two consecutive days, you're going to increase your calories back to maintenance calories. So that's important. Uh, So you're going to go back to 100 percent. We want you to increase your calories all in the form of carbohydrates. And then when you go back to Monday through Friday, you need to reduce your calories back to um, what what came to be a 35% caloric deficit. And then when they did that, they had an average 25% caloric deficit throughout the week. So we go forward seven weeks, what happened, and also during those seven weeks, the subjects were flexible dieting, so we didn't tell them what foods to eat, but they had to track their macros. We also supervised every single workout. So every single set, every single rep was under our supervision throughout the entire study. The end of seven weeks, they both lost the same amount of body fat. The the, the differences were in metabolic, resting metabolic rate and fat-free mass. So we actually, when we looked at fat-free mass, there was not a statistically significant difference between the groups. But when we accounted for water, when we said, hey, let's take the water component out of this, which we call dry fat-free mass, then we realized a statistically significant difference. Now, the, the, the difference was the refeed group retained their dry fat-free mass, whereas the other group that didn't take breaks, they actually lost dry fat-free mass. And the other thing is when you make the comparison to baseline, just looking at baseline changes, we see the same thing or a similar finding. 
there was a significant loss of fat-free mass without correction for water in the continuous group, but the there was not a significant loss in fat-free mass for the refeed group. And the same, we noticed the same thing with um, resting metabolic rate. There were um, the the group that didn't take any breaks. They had a significant decline in resting metabolic rate compared to baseline, where and it was about 80 calories per day. The other group, the refeed group, did not experience a significant decrease from baseline. They actually had about a 40 calorie difference, but there was not a statistically significant difference between the groups. So again, there's different there's different ways to. Uh, and the other important thing is, but there was still a difference. Sorry to cut you off. There was a difference when you make it relative to baseline. Um, and then the other thing is that's important. We only analyzed the subjects that finished the study. So if they didn't follow the workouts or they didn't follow the diet, we didn't analyze them. That would be called a, a an intention to treat analysis. And that's just not done in our field. I don't think you'll find one study in the exercise science field that does that. Now, it, that they do that very commonly in clinical nutrition where they want to know and it makes sense from that perspective. If you give somebody a diet and they can't follow it, well, then don't give them the diet. But in sure. my world or our world, we we expect people to follow the, the diet. We expect them. So that that's really the only I only care about people who actually follow the, the program or the diets. So the study was over how many weeks and how many training sessions were there in, in a given week? Yes, yeah, so it was a seven week study. And I'm trying to remember, I, I, I get my studies confused, but it was, I believe it was four workouts per week, two upper body workouts, two lower body workouts. And we also required that the subjects ingest 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. So like 0.8 grams per pound. Okay. So, so with, with, um, with the design and the outcomes of the study taken into account, are there any adjustments you would make with the design of the study? And would you say there were any limitations? Yeah, so the one change I would make would be on the timing of the post assessments. So, so we knew when you feed people carbohydrates, that can cause them to store more glycogen, or they will store more glycogen, and that that draws more water into your into your into your cells, particularly your muscle and liver. So typically, it's about for every gram of carbs that you that uh, for every gram of glycogen that you store, that pulls with it three grams of water. So what we did, we knew that was going to be an issue. So we we did two things to offset that, and I like what we did, but I would still do something different if I were to replicate the study. What we did to counteract that was we didn't test them until two days after their their post their last day of carbohydrate intake. So they had two days to, to not have the carb increases they, so that they went back on their diet for an additional two days. And then the main reason why we accounted for the water component, why we took out the water, which got us our dry fat-free mass, was to, was to account for well, if they did retain water, we're going to eliminate that variable from our analysis. And that's why we did the dry fat free mass. What I would do differently now is I would have moved their post testing till the end of the entire week of another week of dieting. So they would have had five days of dieting and then the post assessment rather than just waiting two days. That just would have been an extra um, layer of just taking that out completely, any type of carbohydrate or water retention influence. But technically or theoretically, we did control for water by the dry fat-free mass analysis. Awesome. So, so with that taken into account, um, and considering some of the limitations, would you say that the results of a similar design would be different if variables such as optimizing pre and post workout or peri workout nutrition was taken into account or optimizing the resistance training side of things with regards to like individual volume requirements or individualizing exercise selection? Yeah, so I, it's funny you say that. I think the future 
and this is going to be true of my own lab, the future of indiv- of individualizing volume is going to that that needs to be a standard in our in our industry. Um, Absolutely. Now, obviously, if they're non-resistant strain, we're doing a study now in non-resistant strain females and they don't have a history. So but for resistance strain. So that's something, yeah, I would definitely do differently. The peri workout concept for the population that we looked at, I don't think that would have made any difference. I think that concept or that practice that starts to become a, a, a more the leaner and leaner you get or the longer and longer you're in a caloric deficit, I think the more and more important that aspect becomes. My subjects were not competitive bodybuilders. They were resistance trained. Now they were lean. Um, They were very lean compared to the weight loss literature, but they weren't lean compared to on stage competitors. So knowing that that was my population, I don't think that would have had any impact. And Mm. I think the only place where that starts to, it's like when you get into this poverty calorie or you're, you're just, You need every ounce of energy to get through your workouts. That's where I think that stuff starts to have hold a lot more value. Absolutely. Absolutely. So given the demographic, would you say that there may potentially be a greater effect with this type of strategy or modality in, you know, athletes and, you know, uh, in a contest prep setting, for example? Well, yeah, I'm going to rely on our data and and say there if you're dieting, you know, at a moderately high 25 to you know, well, we'll say 25% caloric deficit, there seem to be a a retention of of lean body mass or muscle mass. And even if you get past the the analyses, let's say you disagree with with how how we analyze the the data, you the, the fact that RMR was retained, that directly goes in line with what you would expect if you retain skeletal muscle. So uh, I, I, I don't, I, I, I think there's, there was something to that. Now it should be replicated whether or not we, that would, whether or not we would get the same findings. That's a good question. Um, I do know that I, my lab is about the only one that does these types of dieting studies where we supervise the subjects. So there's there's another consideration where they're not missing workouts. Obviously, we're pushing them during their workout. So that's something else to consider. If it were to be replicated, I, it would be meaningful to have it under a supervised setting. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Great, great answer. So obviously, you know, um, what... What Dr. Campbell just sem- summarized, team, was, you know, the benefit of, you know, refeeds and diet breaks within literature that they investigated. And, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to put two and two together and understand that, okay, if you've been dieting for X amount of week. Also, this was a seven-week study, so let's think of it over the course of, like, a contest prep, 16 weeks, 24 weeks. If you've been in a chronic calorically restricted state for an extended period of time, obviously having a day or two where you enjoy a bit, and remember it's calculated for a reason, but where you have more food typically than you usually do, there's going to be some benefits psychologically. There's going to be some benefits in the gym when it comes to training performance, which could potentially feed back into a preservation of lean body mass or muscle, your most prized possession that you work so hard to build. So, Obviously, there are multiple ways to get to an end goal, but with that in mind, it's very important to take into account some of the emerging uh, literature and, you know, what's what's being demonstrated. So going off uh, into another route, I know you're pretty familiar with some of the literature coming out of University of Tampa. And um, just because we're on the topic of optimizing variables, let's go ahead and chat about, you know, body recomposition. So for those of you who are unfamiliar of body recomposition, it's basically the process of building, uh, building lean body mass or building muscle and losing fat mass or body fat simultaneously. And uh, uh, we tend to we tend to limit 
body recomposition to you know less advanced individuals more more general population individuals but it, when it comes to optimizing things like we just spoke about like volume requirements exercise selection how they set up and execute movements and that's just the training side of things like we consider the nutrition side of things like a sufficient amount of protein optimizing peri workout nutrition really optimizing general health so if we take the time to optimize those variables would you say that an advanced individual is still able to likely undergo body recomposition? Yeah, and and and, and I need to give credit to Chris Barricat there because I think he's done a he he has kind of shifted the narrative. Um, he was the the lead author on the the narrative review that we did that we published, and and again that was under his direction. And before that was published, there was a lot of doubts about just the concept of body recomposition. And what we were able to do under his leadership was just show the science like there's and it wasn't just newbies. It was you said advanced. I'm going to say the word resistance train. We had multiple examples of resistance train subjects. That's what the authors called them in, in the in the research studies where they did have body recomposition. And I used to think, OK, well. Clearly, you have to have resistance training for that to happen. Like, that's got to be one of the stimuli. And I do think that is the most powerful stimuli. But I've been doing other research just in obese populations undergoing aerobic exercise, even walking. They experience body recomposition with no resistance training. So it's all over the literature once you open up your mind to realizing, oh, it exists because it's there. Like, you, you really can't, um, you, you can't. Now, I guess what you could say is, if they're using fat-free mass, fat-free mass is a doesn't necessarily mean muscle like contractile tissue, but they are directly related. I, I would I would I make the assumption if you lose fat-free mass, then you've likely lost some contractile tissue. If you've gained mm -hmm. fat-free mass, you've likely gained some contractile tissue. It's um, obviously that it's the contractile tissue is a smaller component of fat-free mass, but they are directly related and linked. So I'm going to go back and say, yes, in a um, in an advanced, I don't know. I, I don't have data in that level. So if somebody's been training for, you know, 20 years and they're doing everything right, boy, I, it's possible. Um, but clearly in the research literature, it, it's not only possible, we have documentation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so a big reason of me asking that is because, you know, oftentimes being a coach, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this, you've seen it probably over the years is, you know, the biggest limitation that people set for themselves is their their own mind. So, you know, it's just interesting to see that some of the literature is demonstrating X, Y, Z is able to occur. And then, you know, it's validating some of the things and ways we used to think with regards to certain topics you know like you said we're investigating you know some of the topics we we investigate is what people are doing in the real world um so i think that's super awesome and something that you said earlier that really caught my attention was individualizing volume requirements so uh let's go ahead and let's go ahead and go down that road so obviously we know that there's um there's a lot of ways to quantify training volume. Are we going to quantify it versus sets by reps by load? Or are we quantifying it as sets per muscle group per week, right? So this is where, you know, context is very important. And um, we know that it's far more complex than just sets by reps by load when we take into account variables such as you know mechanical tension such as exercise selection such as proximity to failure so i'd love to hear um your thoughts on that because oftentimes i think many people fall into the fallacy and the trap of thinking more is better when you know more training volume could be better, but it's up to a certain point. And there's a lot of individual variance with regards to how person A is going to respond to X amount of volume and how person B is going to respond to X amount of volume. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Um, sets times reps times load to me is it's, it's almost worthless because it, it just doesn't tell me much. Um, if you're going to count calf work in that and, and you're doing 
you know, five sets of calves on a leg press with, you know, 800 pounds, your volume for that week is going to be so skewed. So just my personal approach is I don't ever count calf work in volume um, regardless. So the system that I, that we use in my lab, and I spent a lot of time working on this, we use a, what, and again, I'm also one of my guiding principles or one of my core values of my research team or my research lab is be simple. So whenever we have a choice of more complicated or simple, as long as they're both valid, we're always going to choose the more simple. So I do want to, I want to say that I'm not saying there's, I'm not saying that what we use is the best. I personally think it is, but it's clearly the simplest and it's been validated in the literature. I'll just give a name, Balel. Um, I forget what year, but uh, within the last five years, validated a set volume approach for um, hypertrophy and I think, yeah, more for hypertrophy, as long as the majority of the sets were between six and 20 reps, and as long as all of the reps were within three repetitions of failure. So I've kind of adopted that. Now I've come to the, a, the same conclusion and then was happy that, hey, he validated it. Awesome. Thank you. So if you're going to use set volume, it's simple. If I do five sets of bench press on Monday and I do five sets of flies on Wednesday and I do five sets of push-ups on Friday, that's 15 sets. There's my weekly volume. But we only count those sets if you're within three repetitions of failure. Because I could do a, you know, I could, I could, I could do 10 pound um, dumbbell presses for 80 reps, and I'm not really getting, there's very little mechanical tension there. So we do have to standardize the sets if we're going to use that system. So the way that it's standardized is by effort or what we would say as technical failure. So to the point where you can't do another repetition with good form, or some people would, some people use the term absolute failure, where you cannot complete the concentric portion of the rep. So what we do is as long as your set is within three repetitions of technical or absolute failure, that set counts towards your weekly set volume. Does that, did I explain that? Well, I. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So I think, um, I think very important part of it too, is like, you know, how we, how we communicate training to failure, right? Because someone could be, have someone could have a lackluster setup um for a movement and they're just you know they're doing they're trying to hit the clavicular head and they're trying to and they're actually hitting more of the 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 sternal costal head right for a movement so i think you know uh uh really standardizing your setup and execution across movement patterns is really important um and obviously defining the different type of failure like you said there's technical failure right where it's either a loss of range motion or the inability to contract the target tissue whereas you know something like uh something like uh or uh, mechanical failure sorry but something like technical failure where you hit failure and it's because of your setup or it's because of your execution or because you lost you know stability in a movement i think that's really important to make a distinction because when we're training to failure we're trying to get you know the target muscle and only the target muscle to fail um so i think you know it's just really important when it comes to educating people too because a lot of people think you know volume 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 and i think before you even worry about you know quantifying set volume which is really important you need to worry about making one set count right and making each rep you know working to make each rep your absolute best um so that's 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 very interesting and man i think uh if a lot of people took the time to just decrease the load decrease, you know, how much sets they're doing and really focused on, you know, competent movement, proficient execution, like their, their results, they would not have to be killing themselves in order to get those results. Or, you know, it feels like they're banging their head through a wall just to get from point A to point B. So that's a really great point. And um, so when it comes to optimizing exercise selection, obviously, we know that's less as important for someone who's not as well trained as a trained individual. Um, but when it comes to optimizing exercise selection, 
what are some general rules of thumb that you could uh, you could give the audience? Um, so, for example, either like compound movements or isolation movements or, you know, something that loads the short position or length in position, you know? Yeah. So I think it's important to give some perspective on the the audience that my research serves, because that will give us some context. So my research ut- utilizes what I would call our fitness enthusiasts. So they're serious about their training but they are not elite level. They are not bodybuilders. So in my, in our research, we are, I'm perfectly fine with lat pull down and there you go, or bench press. So I'm not spending a, cause again, we're supervising all of these workouts right. with 40, 50 subjects sometimes. So it's a mass, it's a massive approach to this. Um, so I do not, we do not emphasize individual we're, we're not we're i'm not paying attention to clavicular or sternocostal head of the of the chest so now if i'm in your world of elite competitive bodybuilders now i'm going to pay attention to that stuff and it's it's funny because we both we both share a, a a an acquaintance chris barricat he's somebody that i reach out to um on that he's one of the experts that i go to because I, I i i do i'm not an expert in uh, what I would say, execution to prioritize different aspects. So I'm the wrong person to ask. So now I'm going to go to you as well. So I don't, so I'm not always bugging him. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I can't give an answer. It's just something that I think you, you have an expertise that would be much more valuable than what I could give your audience or even my audience in, in that regard. No worries. Yeah, general cues for exercise selection. I mean, it depends. If for like a, a more general population individual, I think they should be prioritizing their energy in the areas that will provide them the greatest return, and that's going to be compound movements, right? And once they're able to develop proficiency, competency with those compound movements for you know, let's say six months, and they're following a resistance training program, okay, then maybe we could throw in some isolation based movements. But I think it's a it's inappropriate for someone who's beginner, intermediate, or even a novice to be worrying about things like, oh my God, you know, am I loading the short position in this movement? Am I loading the lengthened position in this movement? Right? That's only something that I think about with more of my advanced people and I think about with my training. But generally for you know structuring exercise selection, exercise sequence, there's a lot of things to consider, so, such as like Something I like to do to bring up my delts, something that I've been doing, we know in exercise science, principle specificity applies. So we want to train in a way to bring out certain adaptations. So me, I have a lagging, I have lagging lateral head, right? So a superset that I find a lot of value out of is lateral raises loading the short position, supersetted with lateral raises loading the lengthened position. And in that way, uh, we're able to train the lateral head throughout its full contractile range. So that's a few, that's just like some insight with regards to how I would approach, you know, exercise selection for training, even like calves, you know, we know that manipulating uh, foot angle and femur position um, does impact, you know, what subdivision of the calf we're actually activating. Um, there is a study by, man, I, uh, it's, it's uh, he's from Brazil. I forgot his name, but uh, basically they investigated uh, the gastroc and, you know, the medial lateral. Yeah. And I forgot the name of the author, but I'm glad was, you know which one I'm talking about. Well, I don't remember the author, but we're talking that was published within the last 18 months, correct? The study. Uh, I believe so. I have it in my notes if I could pull it up real quick. Yeah, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with this study. And I mean, just to just to give you a little more, we don't tr- we do not program calves in our in our subject workouts. Um it's it's more like you said, it's more we try to get the largest muscle mass activated in the hour or 45 minutes or whatever, how, whatever the workout is for, for the study. So we, mm. we actually don't program calves in our workouts. Mm. Okay. Great point. Great point. Now, um, I know you said that, um, you know, you generally take, like to take a, uh, a larger encompassing approach. And this is just a- ending that little tangent on exercise selection. We could chat about this all day, but now that I have your time, you know, I want to be respectful of your time so we could, you know, chat about 
very pertinent topic. So you said that, um, you know, one of the most important things in stimulating or maximizing muscle hypertrophy is a proximity to failure. Okay. So with a lot of the literature, we do not have, um, you know, literature and trained individuals to demonstrate a benefit in, you know, taking exercises closer to failure. Um, so if there, if there potentially was a design where you'd be able to set, you know, a, a group that a trained group that takes their sets to failure, a trained group that doesn't take their sets to failure, what, what would the design be like for you? And, um, you know, what do you think the findings would demonstrate of that study? Yeah, and I appreciate what you said. We don't have data in elite bodybuilders. So if there is a an advantage to going to failure, which I don't believe there is in 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 let's just say a normal resistance trained individual. That's where a lot of this data is or in untrained people. I'm hesitant to say that that's not at, that that it's not superior in a an elite level 20 year, 15 year very serious bodybuilder. We can't we don't have data in that group so i'm I, I don't like to speak in absolutes because we don't have absolute studies in all populations now in terms of a study design um one i would want to i i would go with the assumption that that volume is a is is highly related to hypertrophy so i would start there and that's tough um and i'll just share why i've come to that conclusion as I looked at all of the studies, um, whether they were skin folds, whether they were MRI, ultrasound, um, DEXA, muscle biopsy, whatever the measure, there was there. There's always either no difference or an a significant increase in muscle hypertrophy across the different assessment modes. So I, based on that literature, I'm thinking it it's it never has hurt to increase volume, and in some of those, you know, and in some cases it helps. So we also have data to suggest it needs to be slow and methodical, not a large increase. Um, there was a study I I, I want to say it was Lassivus, where they actually did program an increase by twenty percent. I think it was twenty percent, which I think is very high versus just a random a random approach to to volume increases or decreases and we had they they had a significant difference with the with the uniform volume increase in that study mm. so uh, so this back to your question i would want to control for volume and frequency to make sure that those aren't other variables that i have to account for or so that at the end of the study i i don't get you know i don't lose sleep well, but what was it because they trained more frequently or or was it because they actually did less or more volume? So I'd want to eliminate them and and focus on. So I, I think what I would do is just make sure I control for volume. So that may mean that the group going shy of failure would have to do an additional set or an additional, you know, half set per workout on average. I don't know what that looks like, but I would want to control for volume and frequency and only look at differences in the proximity to failure. Mm. Up and coming researchers, listen up. He just made a design for you. <laughs> great points, great points. So, you know, switching gears a bit, we've we've spoken a little bit about refeeding, body recomposition, training, and volume requirements. Now, I would like to speak a little bit about, you know, uh, females or uh, women and fat loss. So... We know that there are some differences physiologically between um, between men and women. And, um, you know, some things that I do with my coaching is I take into account, you know, their cycle because obviously, you know, women have it a bit harder than us. So being a great coach, you know, for me is keeping up with the literature and, you know, trying different things with my coaching to try and get my people better results. So anyways... Um, generally, from what I've learned from the literature, females, you know, they're generally able to tolerate higher training intensities and training volumes um, in that luteal uh, luteal phase, I believe it is. I believe that's uh, the first phase, luteal or follicular. And then, you know, uh, in the latter phase before their period, 
that's generally when it's best to reduce training volume, reduce training intensity. They mean may need to deload. So based on based on what you know, with female uh, or women's women's physiology, and you know what's investigated in the literature, what are some considerations you know coaches or other people should be taken into account when it comes to coaching them? So- so I'll, I'll answer that from two perspectives. What do I do in my research? And then what do what would I advise coaches to do? So in my research, we do not do that. I feel like there's too many questions that need to be answered that are more general. So I don't want to jump to answering question X, Y, and Z when we haven't done L, M, N, and O in terms of the progression of fat loss in resistance trained females. So I'm more of the introductory um, side of this where we we make, we have zero account, accounting for their cycles. Now that, that's an advantage in this sense. If they don't care, if, if they don't make any adjustments or do anything different and they're, and they're, you know, they're using my research as a guideline for what they would implement then it really doesn't matter. They can expect on average to see the outcomes that we report in our studies. Now, if I'm a coach or I'm advising coaches, I would do exactly what you're doing. You have come to a place through experience where, and then maybe some literature, and again, I am I am not familiar with that literature. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a study we did here, which 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 surprised me a little bit. But what you're saying is if you can get them to identify, hey, when are they more hungry? When are they more fatigued? When do they have more energy? I think as a coach, that's why you're paying a coach to to do those individualized case study experiments with clients. Um, again, I don't have we don't do that in my research. It makes sense on an individual client perspective. Um, the other the other part of this, one thing that we did in, in, in my program, this was Dr. Sam Buckner's research lab. He runs our ultrasound assessments with muscle hypertrophy. They did a study. Um, I can't remember his student's name, but what they found was over the course of the of the cycle, over the course of a month, they kept doing like literally almost daily muscle thickness measures, body water measures. And in this study, which they've, you know, they've since told me, well, this is, you know, this actually supports the literature. Uh, total body water is not changing. So I'm like, well, that goes against what I thought. Again, I'm not in this literature. But the 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 likely outcome is the water, the total water doesn't change, but where it's oriented towards the internal organs, towards the reproductive organs during the the, the menstrual cycle. That's likely what happens. Now, again, I don't. They didn't. We didn't have mm. the technology to look at anything other than intra versus extracellular. So that was interesting. I it, again, it was just an area that I don't go that specific. I'm my research is broad. If you do this caloric deficit, you do this resistance training. What's your expected fat outcome? Your metabolism. Now, that's not to say. Give me another three or four years when I when I have some of these more basic questions answered that I don't go to where you're at now with your clients. And in fact, that's what I do. You're always ahead of what I do. You, your um, people like Chris Barricat, the coaches that I have respect for, they're always leading things. And then I come around two years later and say, well, let's see how that, let's see what that, let's, let's, let's test that. Is that valid? I mean, to your credit, if we didn't have some of that literature to give us these results, we would be in arguments all day with people, you know? <laughs> yes. But I, I really, like I said, I have a lot of respect for you as a coach because you're you're doing the things that I I hope I would do just because I don't have research on it or because I choose not to focus. And again, I think I would be too under the microscope to do that at this point. But I would want my coach that I'm paying money to to work with me on that, to work with my energy levels, my hunger, my appetite um, shifts, et cetera. So. For coaches, I'm going to say, don't follow my research, pioneer my research, do something, put it out there, talk about it, and then let me come around later and and then validate it. Mm. Mm. Man, great, great takeaway. And I always like to tell up and coming coaches, you know, the biggest thing that's allowed me to learn and grow is learning through experience, okay, and seeing what the literature demonstrates and implementing it. Because 
The real scientific method is trial and error. And oftentimes, most people are too scared to go through trial and error. And it's like, it blows my mind. I wouldn't be where I am today with if I didn't experience experiment with different approaches over the years or you know different exercises and see what worked for me and see what worked for my clients and look at the you know common common denominator and you know and like oftentimes you know especially when it comes to physique development sports science you know we could chat all day about the best program best periodization model individualizing volume requirements exercise selection but common denominator regardless of the approach is always going to be effort and that's one thing that I want to want to get across to people you know so um just once again i want to thank you for the amazing work that you do and um do you have anything you want to uh leave the audience with maybe follow you you know some future projects you have in the works yeah yeah thank you um one i want to i'll thank you again for the opportunity to talk about this stuff i always it's conversations like this with with like elite coaches that just like, man, I got to do, now I got to think about this. So I, I like, I like the, the intellectual stimulation. So thank you for that. Um, I would add two things. Um, I'm really only active on Instagram. I, everything I do is on Instagram. So if, if your followers would find me at Bill Campbell PhD. And as you said, I, I, I try to do quiz questions, multiple choice, um, always in the area of sports nutrition and bodybuilding, but I would say uh, physique enhancement. Um, th that's always the area. So we talk about diets and training stuff. And this is the first time I think I've been able to say I actually have a product. So I released a, a digital guidebook last week, which is all of my thoughts, my philosophies on resistance training. So everything we talked about today, I have in there and I cite the science of what brought me to why I think effort is the most important thing, why I think volume is important, assuming effort is standardized, um, why I think that a flexible eating lifestyle is, is um, good for most people, especially as we learn nutrition, as we educate ourselves why higher protein is better. So it's all my thoughts, all my philosophies, the research that supports it. And then I just put it into, um, I, I, in that guidebook, I'm appreciating lifestyles. So I don't anticipate everybody can lift six days per week. So it, there's something there for somebody who identifies, hey, I live three days per week. Okay, here's, here's, here's what that looks like. I'm, I'm a higher level person. Okay, here's what that looks like. And where can people find this? Oh, yeah, good. Go to my Instagram at Bill Campbell PhD and just go to my the the link in my bio. It'll take you right to the sales page. All right, guys, you heard it. Go check out his Instagram page, link in bio, download his guidebook. I'm sure you'll find a ton of value out of it. And um, thank you again for coming on. I look forward to potentially you know future discussion, training session in the future. Yes. Yeah. I need. Yeah. You need to give me some some tips. <laughs> oh, yeah. It. If I could give you anything, that'd be great. I appreciate it. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you.